Hello, and welcome to 10 Very Big Books, a Malazan read-through podcast. I'm Peter Mond. I've read each book in the main series. However, my friends are reading the series for the first time. With me today is my friend and close confidant, India Jones. Hello, everyone. And rounding out the podcast is Joshua, Mean Streets, Dean Baker. You know I'm mean it from the streets, baby. And we finished our read-through of Dead House Gates. And before we move on to Memories of Ice next week, we have one last conversation. Um, it's our pleasure to welcome him back to the show. Um, I'm sure you know him. And I'm going to go ahead and call him friend of the show, Steven Erickson. <laughs> Peter, um, at least on this screen, the angle of your camera, it makes you very godlike. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> That's, uh, I was trying to evoke that, you know, very purposefully. Very effective. Mm, thank you. So you all survived Dead House Gates. We made it through, yeah. Just at, barely. Just barely I, on my end. I would say at times thrived, at other times de- the opposite of thrived. I agree. Fair enough. It was a great time for Pete. I got nothing but good things to say. <laughs> and uh, to start us off, India has a, 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 our first question. I do. Okay, so, you know, back when we were first uh, recording our first episode, you had mentioned a little bit of the backstory. And so I was kind of wondering for the second book, you mentioned you were starting, like, to write it Memories of Ice, I think. And then it became, it, like, got lost somehow. And you were like, okay, never mind, I'm not writing this. Um, And then you wrote Dead House Gates instead. And I was wondering if you think that experience of semi-writing a different story kind of helped you plan out what became of Dead House Gates? Um, you mean semi-writing Memories of Ice, the beginning? Right. And that, that do you think that may have like affected the outcome of this story? Or were they always going to be, you just completely stopped thinking about it um, and started something fresh? Well, that's a good question. I mean, thanks. my, my initial thought was, Memories of Ice uh, are basically follows along, um, following after Gardens of the Moon. Um, same continent, uh, most of the same characters. And so, in a sense, it was fortuitous that I lost uh, the stuff that I had written because the order would not have made sense to go to Deadhouse Gates after Memories of Ice. Um, you'll find that out once you um, slog through uh, Memories of Ice, which is a, <laughs> a huge book. Probably one of the most problematic ones for me to write because I moved from the UK back to Canada in the middle of writing it. Um, so it took, that one took longer than almost any other uh, book in the series. Um, but Dead House Gates was very much a self-contained story. So um, I knew once I got to it that it was going to basically write itself. And then hmm. for Memories of Ice, um, I think by that stage... I didn't really have worked out um, the final, well, the action scenes at the end of Memories of Ice I'd worked out, but how it tied into Dead House Gates, I didn't. So um, Mm. it turned out to be a good thing because I think the structure and the order is the way it should be now. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Let me ask, because I think uh, you say Dead House Gates is a contained story, and I think um, obviously it's part of this larger series, but also House of Chains really picks up a lot of threads it left off. Uh, it it kind of leaves at the end of the book. So hmm, I, I guess I was struck by you saying it was kind of a self-contained thing because I think some stories are and then other stories are leaving a lot of rope onward. So what what do you think was maybe complete, completed at the end of the book in that way? Um, well, the basic uh, chain of dogs is is mm. to me the, the core of it. So if you think of your, your classic Star Trek Next Generation episode. You have two storylines that run through every episode. Um, you got the human interest one and you got the action one. So being very, very, to simplify things, the journey to uh, Tremolor uh, and the Path of Hands um, is the uh, almost the emotional one in a sense. Uh, and it's the one that continues on, um, that drags uh, the story into the future books. As we know, with the conclusion of Coltan and, and the uh, Chain of Dogs, the only thing that follows on from that are echoes mm-hmm. and, and ripples. Um, so it ends very clearly outside the walls of Aaron. Uh, but the other story is the one that, and also I think maybe Kalam um, visiting the Empress is also another one that yeah. is kind of leapfrogging ahead, whereas everything that occurs with the Chain of Dogs, with one exception, um, ends. At, at the end of this book, the end of mm-hmm. Dead House Gates. Mm-hmm. The exception being um, 
the Uyghur's soul being collected. Yeah, that makes sense. I, fo I follow you. I follow you. Yeah. So, so just to to uh, warn India, um, Memories of Ice is kind of like Dead House Gates and Gardens of the Moon smashed together. Mm. I think I like that vibe. I you do. That sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Revisiting some old friends, coming in yep. for some some new friends. That is something I'm excited about. Is to because well, it's a kind of a podcast point, but we'll finally start to have conversations about characters we've met before. And I think mm -hmm. that'll be interesting to return to because part of what's great about long series like this and long books like this is you're following characters through a very long journey. So I think it's going to be interesting to have a dialogue about them throughout the length of it. Bearing in mind that I cut some of those journeys very short. <laughs> uh, so Josh, you have a question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, one thing that is, I mean, like a prevailing plot point of Dead House Gates is the rebellion that is taking taking uh, place across seven cities, mm -hmm. um, and and we also hear a little bit of of Coltane and the Wiccans um, and their thoughts on the Empire. So I feel like from a lot of perspectives, the the Malazan Empire, Malazan Empire is being presented in this very negative light. But I'm curious, uh, do, two parts. One, do you think like do you think the citizens of Malazan see the Empire as bad? I know that's really boiling it down to too big of a thing and also do you see the malazan empire as a, as a force of good a force of bad is it just a force like how do you perceive it well it's it's one of the complex issues that relates to colonialism uh any any kind of imperial expansion so i'm i'm going to be treading on very very thin ice on this one uh, mm -hmm. or at least walking a tightrope uh probably is a better metaphor um if you think of the roman empire it certainly brought um, what quote unquote civilization uh, to many nations, um, and it did so in a way that, while it imposed military control and often political control, it did not fundamentally impose cultural change. So mm -hmm. religions could be maintained uh, that were local indigenous religions. Um, primarily, that empire expanded for economic reasons more than anything else. Uh, they needed the slaves, they needed the loot. Um, and so the Malaysian Empire is similar in that respect. Um, mm. But the uprising is actually modeled on uh, what was generally known as the Indian Mutiny uh, in British-controlled India um, in the 19th century. And again, you know, I mean, one can look sort of at, from a post-colonial point of view and, and sort of rail against the injustices and uh, the impositions that were forced upon uh, the, the civilization. Um, and I would not argue against that. At the same time, there was a kind of an economic spur that was created by that, that mm. um, led India into a much more of a global perspective. Um, so, I mean, colonialism is weird. I mean, there's there are good elements, there are bad elements. And, and you know, throughout history, when you look back uh, on these moments, uh, there will be periods in which we see only the bad and then periods in which, you know, at one point we saw only the good, mm -hmm. say in the late 20th or early 20th century. So it, it is complex what the Malaysian Empire is. And in terms of the citizens, I would say by and large, they are fairly content with the situation. Um, one thing that empires do when they expand is they is money pours in. So it creates wealth. And prosperity comes from that. And then you want, it, you want the imposition of uh, a legal system that's um, basically balanced across all territories of the empire, hmm. which becomes then predictable in a sense. Um, so there is, there is the good and the bad in empire. And that's why um, I always wanted to explore uh, the Malaysian empire from both outside and from within. And then, of course, through the military point of view, where it's just basically a job and your expansion it's almost irrelevant mm -hmm. to um, what it is you have to do on a daily basis. Right. Now he steps off the tightrope. Yeah, wow. Maybe. <laughs> we'll see what the response is. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Mm. You mentioned earlier that you kind of viewed the Coltane chain of dog story as kind of being at the center piece of it, right? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it is a military story somewhat, and you write about, and, and throughout the series, you write plenty from the point of view of soldiers. However... Uh, specifically here, you write from uh, Duker's point of view, primarily. primarily. 
So I'd, I'd ask, like, why did you choose to set this military story from this historian's perspective? Um, again, there's, there's always a meta element to, to the novels I write. Um, and so the historian's perspective is the one that is the broadest one possible. Uh, but it is challenging that you have a character who is in the midst of living that history and experiencing the history, even as he comments on it. Um, yeah, and so he has to he has to do that one kind of mental remove one step at least away from everything that's surrounding him. But of course, one of the pitfalls of history as as a as a, as a discipline as a subject is it can easily dehumanize. And so, because Duker joins the chain of God, dogs, he is forced into a more human perspective, almost a sociological or anthropological perspective on um, on the on the fate of those who are part of a history that is, that is taking place, that he is witness to. The historian is, is very much inclined to, usually because they're talking about or writing about something that occurred a century ago or five centuries ago, um, to sort of step back and be clinical and detached and remote. And that's the position that Duker starts with, but he certainly doesn't end that way. And that's a journey I wanted to explore. And you think that distance um, is is this pitfall of maybe dehumanization or this kind of detachment? Yeah, yeah. it can be, and certainly, especially when you're looking at the you know broad brushstrokes of uh, movements in history, um, it's it's very easy to just forget that that people's lives are involved in these things, and you just cover the main events and and you know the main political figures and and all of those kinds of things. Um, so maybe there's there's something of a, a plea for social history, which is a sub-discipline of history, um, yeah. which is kind of taken over uh, within the discipline, as far as I can tell. Um, it is the approach people tend to use now, which I certainly prefer. Mm. Um, just piggybacking off what you said, this whole um, book seems to have like a much more, uh, I guess, like a, a character personal journey feel to it like I feel every character um has gone through something and it makes you question multiple characters whether they're good or bad um or I'm not sure if that was intentional but I feel like it might have been (laughs) yeah so so I'm wondering if if it did you did you do that on purpose to get quite like the readers to question um more of the morality of everything and if you wanted us to think you know lacine might not be a horrible horrible person she might just be like a cog in in a machine that's out of her control as well or um yes yes. you know yes so i was just wondering your take on that yeah it's very much a case of um people can often especially in in huge movements like that they they do lose personal control they lose control of uh even their own lives um and so each of the characters uh are following a particular approach to that kind of thinking so felison has her um freedom taken away right off the bat right. and um she has to fight her way back to it and when she finally gets back to it it turns out it's not freedom at all because she has inherited an entire army and a complete rebellion um and that will play out uh, in House of Chains, the fourth book. And then you have people like Heborik uh, and Duker, um, those two primarily, both uh, historians uh, in one fashion or another, and having immersed themselves into this, this moment of history, uh, become part of it. And so they take that journey. Um, Coltane is more of a, a standoffish figure. Uh, I never wanted to get into his head at all. So mm-hmm. he simply witnessed, um, mm-hmm. as an historian would do, they would simply witness. They would not know what goes on in his mind. And then to play against all of that, you had Mapo and Icarium, because he is the, Icarium is the, the character who carries the burden of uh, historical tragedy with him everywhere, but has no actual memory of of that burden. And in many senses, you, know, you can look at... Um, well, anyone now in, in any particular country, um, especially I think the more recent generations, that for them, I mean, history was almost became a subject that wasn't even taught and hasn't been taught very well in, in education, schools in Canada and the States, and et cetera. And so in a sense, it's as if a whole generation is becoming an acarium. Um, you know, you've even got Holocaust deniers these days. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of extraordinary to the extent to which willful uh, forgetfulness of history um, 
can play a huge role in what happens in, in the present day. And in that sense, Icarium is is sort of the walking metaphor of that. Um, wow. Kind of kind of jumping off of that, uh, a, a question I was trying to deal with in this one is I feel like a lot of the characters in this book, I really understand the purpose of the journey they took, um, especially in like the, the here and now purpose, maybe not the broader implications of it. But Mappo and Icarium's journey is the one that I, I feel like it's, it's, I mean, it's cyclical so much so that I feel like that's the point of it, but I don't know if that's, I can't like for sure, because the whole idea of the relationship is they repeat this idea of everything's fine, everything's fine, oh, Akarium does thing, it's fine, Mappo's cool, and we're good again. And that happens in this book, but I, I'm, I feel like Mappo goes through so much personal growth in this, but it feels like at the end he's just right back where he started, and I was trying to figure out if, if there's... I, like, what is the purpose of everything they go through on the path of hands if it seems like at the end they're right back where they started? Well, but you see, Mappo is, is trapped in the same cycle because yes. Icarium is trapped in that cycle. Um, so Icarium, his cycle is one of forgetfulness. And so there's a tendency because of his nature to repeat various desires and actions, his constant search for his memories. Um, Mappo is the opposite. He's trapped in remembering. And so he has to play a role of basically matching uh, Icarium's innocence and ignorance. But you pay a huge price because he knows way too much. Mm -hmm. And so he has to play that role. Um, and it becomes more and more onerous as time goes on. And as the series goes on, of course, it ultimately um, it reaches, a, reaches a crisis point for sure. Mm. Not to give too much away. Yeah. Okay. So this has been pretty heady stuff so far. Um, yeah, I any, was... <laughs> any sort of things that you laughed at? You know, I, really, I, <laughs> I got one. I'm here. I'm here. I was, Thank I was God. you to oh. comment on um, Mincer's demotion. Uh, the um, when Coltin actually uh, strips the Marine yeah. uh, captain of his rank. Well, here, here's a more lighthearted question. You're, you're, it was a good call because man, we were <laughs> yeah. We were in there. Um, so, like, Ben and Roach are characters in this book. And yeah. so, like, what made you feel like, man, let's give these dogs names. Let's get them in here. Let's get these faces glown up. You know what I mean? Like, let's put them on display. Um, I had a scene. Uh, uh, bear in mind, most of my novels begin at the end. In other words, I had the scene. Oh, you just answered one of my questions. Scenes. Um, and so I had this scene in my head of, Mapo and Akarium on the side of um, the Aaron Way. They've arrived too late to save anybody of interest to us. Sure. Um, and he's got this, this ability to, or this potion of healing of some form. And yet, of course, there's nobody left. We've lost them all. But what I needed was, given the, the extent um, and the extremity of the loss um, of the fall uh, outside Aaron and the, the breadth of that tragedy, um, I needed to answer it with a gesture of humanity. And mm -hmm. so I did not want any particular survivors from uh, the Wiccans or, or the last bits of the army. So the only thing I was left with were a couple of dogs. And so they become they become the gesture of humanity um, mm -hmm. that Mapo makes that is an answer to everything we've we've sort of experienced up to that point. Yeah. And it was that, while writing this is when I realized that if you're going to go big on the tragedy, when you answer it with that gesture of humanity, go small, mm. and smaller the better. Mm. So this is just—it's uh, almost like an aside. He says, "Oh, oh you know, okay, I'll, maybe I can heal these dogs." Um, and yet, that is emotionally, I hope, um, the answer to everything that's preceded it, because humanity, you know, survives regardless of all this. Um, and that simple gesture of compa compassion uh, mm -hmm. is an answer to everything we've seen in the chain of dogs, mm -hmm. and also. Uh, I like the fact that I had these two ridiculous dogs running around. Yeah, um, oh, they're pretty great. Yeah, one of them is based on a red healer I had, which I picked up in Bisbee, Arizona, and I named it Bisbee. Like an actual dog you had. Yeah, this was a, a male red healer that um, basically wanted to be the most dominant creature on the planet, and it was just <laughs> absolutely hell to handle. Um, there were times, you know, the, the <laughs> a dominance thing when you reach under. Uh, onto the opposite forelimb of the dog and you flip it and you get your hand down onto its neck. And believe me, you have to do this with this kind of dog. And so I was doing that from when I was a puppy until one point, I think I was out in a field somewhere and I, I, I went to uh, establish dominance again and it chewed my right hand into a bloody mess. Oh, and that's when I realized 
this dog is is simply beyond my um, ability to uh, to handle. And so Bisbee ended up going to um, a rancher who absolutely mm-hmm. loved the dog because uh, he's the kind of dog that can get kicked in the head by a cow and not notice. Um, so, ah. um, and then of course the the roach dogs. Um, well, I've seen a few dogs that look like roach, and they are quite amusing. So, anyways. This is a huge spoiler, but they survive all the way through until the 10th book. What? <laughs> yeah, they're like characters. What? Stop. <laughs> yeah. Did somebody I didn't learn them? I didn't <laughs> learn their names. I thought they would be... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gessler and, and Stormy. Ah. Uh, yeah. I do love Gessler and Stormy. <laughs> oh, don't you have a question about him, Inge? What a great segue. I do. <laughs> yeah. um, it's almost okay. like we planned this. Oh, my... <laughs> And also, we we tried to make it a little bit lighter, but it just seemed to get a little bit more heavy. But I'm I'm fine with it. <laughs> um. Okay. So, how did Stormy, Gessler, Truth, and Bowden? We'll, yeah. We'll, 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 oh, great, awesome. Um, almost become ascendant. Um, by going through the Warren. And what is if it's not too spoilery? What will it take for them to fully ascend? I feel like it probably is. That's pretty spoilery. Um. Mm. Yeah. In a sense, one could argue that they're already ascended. They just don't know it. Um, what does that even mean? <laughs> See, you just have this way. <laughs> You're just saying words. No. Um, quite often, ascendancy. I mean, if somebody is in the in the books, if somebody is is um, striving for ascendancy, trying to achieve it, they won't get it. Oh. It basically it needs to arrive. Um, as a direct uh, and inevitable consequence of their nature. Um, huh. So, of their personalities, if you will. Um, so, in that sense, I guess the only the only two who actually, well, even they pursued it. Uh, I'm thinking um, Shadow Throne and, and Cotillion. Uh, but that, again, was, they went searching for it, but that it was their nature to go searching. Mm. So, maybe they, they're the exception. But by and large, it's, um, things happen to people, and they're not aware of the fact that it's had a profound effect that will send ripples through, uh, well, the Malazan universe, if you will. Um, speaking of the Ascendant Shadow Thrones, I just want to say, Steve, you are crushing these segues on accident. It is perfection. Uh, uh, so we, we've we've met Ascendants, um, but I feel like Shadow Throne is one of the Ascendants that uh, keeps popping up that is um, much more detached, like physically detached from humanity. I mean, he's in his own very angsty shadow castle. Um, and so whereas like the, the people, the ascendants that we meet who like travel among humans occasionally, like they seem to have some sense of humanity. Shadow throw, but a lot of the other ones, it, it really feels like they are fully either insane or mm-hmm. could not care less about humans. But Shatterthorn has that the, the scene at the end of this book where he's just like, all right, each of you get one thing. You're all pretty cool. And that's one of like the few like empath- empathetic moments I've seen from an Ascendant. So so I guess my, my question is like, do you do Ascendants inherently lose part of their humanity? Like, is that just a thing? Or is it lost over like time being, you know, old and living through the years? Is it kind of just worn away? I think it's it's... I would, I would answer that it's a bit of both, but I think the former one um, is actually probably the more uh, obvious. Mm. Um, and if you want it as a, a kind of metaphor, it's, um, believe it or not, there are uh, physiological changes that occur to people when they become extremely wealthy and they actually oh. begin, to, they begin to lose empathy. And so- Tell me more. It, no, no, no <laughs> in the sense to suddenly find oneself in power uh, and in our world right now, power is expressed entirely economically. Yeah, changes happen. Changes happen uh, physiologically. Okay. And uh, you can certainly look that up. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, and so I guess when you think of you know, ascendant to godhood, um, ascendancy to godhood, we kind of take that into you know, even a more extreme case. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Shadow Throne, a lot of his ghostliness, his ephemeralness, um, if that's a word, relates more to self-protection than anything else. Um, But later on, uh, you're going to find there will be one of those two, Shadow Throne or Cotillion. I don't know if it's already started, but um, they begin to struggle with that loss of humanity to a large extent. Hmm. So I do address it. Okay. 
Hmm. So to bring us back to Seven Cities, I think this setting is is very, it's quite different than Darugistan and Genabagas. Um It has these echoes of the ancient civilizations. Um, its weather is quite terrible and its insects are even worse. Um, yeah. So yeah. what's up with the bugs? Well, uh, I was on a, a dig in Belize in 1983 and we were camped um, just in grass huts uh around or just near uh, just up from uh, a river called the new river hilarious name just near orange walk town in northern belize and um there is a uh have you heard of block flies yes no. yes i was like one entomology class and yeah, yeah they came up block flies are my inspiration for the for the blood the blood flies mm. um basically they lay eggs in grass mosquitoes pick up the the um the eggs on their viscous and then when they bite you the egg goes in underneath <gasps> your skin and oh. then a larva starts growing underneath your skin and it basically um gets bigger and bigger like half inch long uh, and creates a bump on your skin with a hole in the top and it needs the holes because every now and then it sticks its head out to take a breath and then sticks its head back down so um oh. yeah so AJ, AJ, can you just quick cut that so we can keep... <laughs> <laughs> But anyways, I remember, I, I think, I think being, uh, being exposed to a pig that was being fattened up for slaughter, um, covered in bot flies. Oh, God. So he, he had the task of removing them. I think my friend Richard Callahan did most of this. And the way of removing the bot flies was to get a whole bunch of tobacco and create tobacco juice. And then you rub that into each of the uh, sores, if you will. And that either oh. stuns the larva or it blocks the air hole. So its head has to stick out and then you can pluck them out. Ugh. But anyways, that was probably one of the worst jobs on earth. Uh, yeah. Removing like 50 botfly larva from a, a pig, which I... then got butchered and eaten and made everybody sick as dogs. So I didn't expect the answer to how did you come up with the worst bug ever it was to be, well, there's a worse it's one real. on earth. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real bad one. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, that's probably a starting point, but I was going to say, um, besides maybe these terrible nightmare bugs, um, <laughs> what, what, what elements do you keep in mind when you introduce a setting, especially when it's like a setting that you're trying to introduce as a reader that's as large as a continent? You know, it's not just a city. You're, you're bringing mm -hmm. people to a whole mm, civilization and, and, and region. Well, I mean, you start with a map, um, and you create linguistic rules for the naming of places. Um, but then you split those up because no single continent uh, is home to only one culture, uh, multiple cultures, uh, yeah. often related to each other, and maybe even uh, linguistic sharing a family, a linguistic family. So start that way. And then, believe it or not, I think Cam and I actually gamed a bit in the Bronze Age of the Malazan, pre Malazan. Uh, world um, and so I even had an early, I had a Bronze Age map of uh, seven cities long mm -hmm. lost um, and that one of course is quite useful for layering uh, the civilization and the cultures mm -hmm. and then we had the full backstory of um, the first empire and uh, so there, there was a lot to play with there but in terms of creating verisimilitude it, it's the small details that count so yeah the blood flies are an example um, the cultural practice of um, creating sigils um, that had uh, secret meetings or private meetings uh, painted all over walls and, and alleys and et cetera, et cetera, is kind of like a, a private language that goes on uh, completely in front of the Malaysian occupiers, but they are entirely unaware of it. And so it, there's a, a kind of a complexity going on, um, which I really needed to get in there as early as possible so that uh, when everything explodes, it's it may appear to be entirely surprising that the uprising, and I remember you guys talked about this, the uprising seemed to come out of nowhere. Well, mm -hmm. it was foreshadowed on the walls of every city. So in that sense, it didn't come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And just like the Indian mutiny, um, it just takes one event to trigger something like that, and it just takes off. Yeah. Indy, I think you have our next question. Yeah, I do. Well, you almost said defeated. Like, yeah, because I feel like coming out of this, like there's so much more to. I don't know. It just leaves me questioning a lot of what I read and why I didn't realize it sooner. But um, um, this is just a general question. It 
it's not a, based on anything. Um, what was your favorite storyline to write about in Dead House Gates? Um, and did you already know the end, which I think you kind of alluded to that you did when you started writing it? Oh, the favorite storyline by far was for listens. I had a feeling you'd say that. <laughs> nice. Same. Yeah, I knew she'd be the most challenging character for the readers. Um, mm. Mm. But I really wanted to write about um, a severely damaged but very young individual who is forced into doing whatever she needs to to survive, um, which requires a certain level of inde well, independence, if you will, that can often be expressed as hostility towards others, even those people mm -hmm. who are trying to help her. So she was, um, she was certainly my favorite character to write by far, um, because her journey was, um, I, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's entirely unique. I mean, there are victims of abuse, um, all over the world and, and they take that journey. And, um, quite often those closest to them who try to help them are the ones who are first pushed away. So it struck me as, as, um, a kind of an authentic storyline, uh, to follow and to explore which we don't often see in, in fantasy, um, tends to avoid those sort of heavy issues about unlikable characters. And then, you know, for me, um, everything she said and everything she did made perfect sense, even though it made her appear to be very unlikable, but it did make mm -hmm. sense. So, yeah, for listen. Yeah, I liked her too. She had the most interesting, I just think her angst, like, was... It seemed very, like, for that story, very real and very authentic. Um, and her, her, her rebirth, which me and Josh are still, I think, a little puzzled over, um, <laughs> was, it was, I guess, symbolic in a way, but, um, also extremely, extremely confusing. I still don't know when it happened. It just kind of happened. Like, it just, it, can we talk a little more about I, And that? I do want to say. I'm not sure if that. Yeah. And we had some fans send us a paragraph <laughs> yeah. and they were like, it explains it right here. And it clearly says, it's like. In the fiddle, it's like, and she felt some power, and then she, and then uh, she does just a bunch of magic, and it's like, no, 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 no. Where does the power? <laughs> how does the power? She doesn't read the book. When? Well, you're asking me to yeah. comment on a, a specific scene of a book that I wrote, what feels like 40 years ago now. Yes. <laughs> um, and I don't reread my stuff, so this goes way back. But wow, it's more in the sense of the journey actually was her journey Ugh, to power. Peter, Peter's so That's smug Peter, right That's now. What That's, exactly That's what I said. That's what Peter said. said. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it had to be her journey to power. Um, and so I think you find out a little bit. I don't know if you do. If you find out the backstory to the first Shaikh, Maybe that's in fourth the fourth novel. I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah, I think it comes later on. Mm. But yeah, it's it's everyone who who takes on that mantle goes through a, a pretty horrendous journey to get there. And so it's as if it's it's um, the landscape itself and and the cultures and, and everything that happens to a person brands them and prepares them um, to take on the role of leading a rebellion against the vagaries of, of civilization and, and oppression and all the rest. So yeah, kind, kind of a, a ready-made um, role to be taken on by certain people. Hmm. And so she walks right into it and the timing was perfect, almost perfect. Yeah, pretty much, right? Yeah. yeah um, Toblakai and, and Leoman had to wait a while, but yeah. Yeah. Ah, well. <laughs> uh, I, I have a question. The um, whole time I thought she was like fake. I literally thought she was lying. I was like, this this can't be what it is. This can't be, she can't be it, but she's it, baby. Mm -hmm. She's a real deal. I, I set it up so that she didn't know whether it was going to be uh, sorry or Absalar or... or I think that's how I set it up. We got yeah, Andy yeah. and I got into a, yeah. a, an argument on on text about that because we I I was convinced it was Felison and she was like it's got to be sorry it's got to be sorry. <laughs> Honestly, I hadn't even considered it was sorry until she's been she's been yeah. preparing her whole life for this moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, moving a little bit away from Dead House Gaze, I I have a question about um your writing style. So you said earlier um and intrigued me. You said you start with with scenes. Um, and you mentioned starting from the end, but when you sit down to, to write a book, which is just a crazy thought to me, I can't write much. Um, so do you, do you, do you sit down and do you type chapter one and just start there or, yeah. or like, where do you start? You do? Yeah. I start with the prologue actually, but oh. it, I, it's a linear style of writing. Yeah. I don't okay. cut and paste ever. Wow. Cause I think there has to be a, a, an innate intrinsic rhythm to what you're doing. And mm. for me, the only way to maintain that rhythm is is to 
start on page one and end on you know page eleven hundred or whatever. Do you, do you ever do you ever like write yourself into a corner with that? Like you feel like you're getting there, you're getting there, and you're like, wait a minute, uh oh, what no, have I done? Um, I, I've mentioned this before, but um, I don't know how to write novels. Right, uh, you're a short story a short expert. Story writer. And so I write in a very cyclical fashion. So each scene I create is a self-contained mini short story. Mm -hmm. And then I just tack on the next one and then the next one and then the next one. And by, you know, after a year or eight months, I'm done. Uh, the novel's finished. So it never feels overwhelming. It's always, you know, I've got this scene to do. And it may take two pages. It may take ten. Um, but then it's done and it wraps itself. And then I move on to the next one. So it's very much a short story writing style applied uh, on a fairly large scale. Okay. You make it sound so easy. Yeah, you do. It's pretty infuriating. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like, yeah, I just I mean, write I it and then I'm done. It's like the book. Yeah. Obviously, you've done it for like forever. It makes, it makes sense that you're great, but it's just, it still is bonkers. Well, I mean, the challenge for all beginning writers, uh, and this is the first thing I say to them, is finish what you start, because it is so easy to get really excited about something, and you're ripping along for the mm. first 20 or 30 or 40 pages, um, and then it starts getting hard. And what's happening at that point is the first 20 or 30 pages that you wrote, you already know how to do, so it's not hard. So it gets you there. But to, per to continue the story and to bring depth to that story, um, that's where, uh, you know, 30 pages, 40 pages in, where you're stalling is where you actually begin to learn how to do that kind of stuff. Mm. And what happens to a lot of beginning writers is they think, oh, well, this story's gone, gone cold on me. Um, I'm no longer excited about it. And so they drop it, and then they start the next story and go for 20 or 30 pages. And then it gets hard, and then it, they feel it gets cold, and so they drop it. And so... In other words, you have to finish what you start because you're going to mm -hmm. learn um, everything you need to know about writing by actually finishing what you start. So, mm. Have you ever thought about recording yourself talking and then just like really solid ambient like wave crashing noise? Because like I would 100% buy this just to like pump myself up before something. Uh, talking about what? Steve, anything. You can say anything. That's a, that's a new take. I can talk about writing. Uh, I can do that until um, you guys all die of old age. I mean, or I will. One of the one of the two. And, and I do love to teach writing, and I love to sort of try to convey something of the sheer potential of what's possible uh, with the written word. And so, yeah, that's great stuff. But I tend to do that in essay form, so I tend to write it more often than not. Mm, have you have gotcha. you done a lot of teaching in your life? No, not nearly as much as I would like to. I, I, occasionally, I, I'll run a workshop here in Victoria, just uh, mm. and I don't charge for it. It's just four or five people and get them together, and uh, either every week or every two weeks, uh, we critique and, and go over stuff. Mm. So, uh, not doing it at the moment because I'm just finishing up uh, the next novel, and um, when I get to this point, uh, I'm starting. I start to go from three hours a day to four, four and a half, five, and it just it just starts going and going. So that's what I'm into right now. And mm. I should be finished by the end of February. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. It, it's so Lots interesting. characters as well. So. Mm. Mm. I don't know how you, how you even have the mental storage to like remember something that you wrote about three books ago and then return back to it and are able to explain a whole backstory we're past three books and we're <laughs> i literally don't know who that guy was who did the, the 10 books because i don't have that mental storage capacity anymore at all yeah. quite often um is i go onto my facebook page and i just ask the fans to give me help on that and they can they can go back and, and they know my stuff <laughs> and so they they give me um the information i need because um yeah if I was trying to track it down, I'd have to be carrying these books around with me everywhere. They're big and heavy. And... Oh, we can attest to that. Uh, well, yeah. let me maybe ask you a question about God is Not Willing. Um, uh, how, how does it, like, I don't know, you have such a broad scope, since I know you're picking up after where the crippled God leaves off. Um, well, somewhat. Uh, you, you have su such a broad scope of things to touch back in on. How, how did you go about sorting in on which plot lines you wanted to return to, when and, and how? This was one of the first cases where I didn't know where the trilogy was beginning. I knew mm -hmm. it was going to be 10 years after, um, thereabouts, uh, after The Crippled God. And so I started writing stuff, 
and uh, I went for at least two months. I must have written about 80 or 90 pages when I realized that I was writing the opening of the second book, not the mm. first. And so I had to basically stop there and step back and come back or head all the way back to something else that actually, and the only thing that had me holding off was that Carson was not going to show up in it. Mm. Um, and even though it's called the, the Carson or long trilogy, um, he is, he's not there in the first novel at all. And so I was a bit hesitant about doing that. And yeah. um, eventually I just wrote a little thing on Facebook um, asking how the readers and the fans would feel about that. And the response was generally very positive. They, they weren't bothered too much because it's Carson's legacy that I need to be writing about first before I can get back to him. So yeah, it took a little bit longer uh, than expected, but at the same time, once it's done, I've got 80 pages of the second novel already done. Nice. So, yeah. How did you know that you were writing like this, the beginning of the second book? Like, how do you, how do you know that? Um, I realized that I was leaving way too much backstory. Um, uh... And I needed to, if I was going to, I was coming up with all this, all these new characters and a new storyline and stuff, but it was disconnected to Carson Orlong. Uh, I mean, Carson was going to be one of the characters of the book, but um, it was not the case of uh, he, that he was going to be central to the storyline. And then I realized, well, if he's not central to the storyline, um, there has to be a reason for that. And so then I thought, well, okay, the only way I could come up with a reason for that is to build that backstory and involve the characters. Um, this will be more relevant to you guys once you've done at least the first part of House of Chains to you new guys. But the legacy of Carson Orlong is a pretty extensive one. And so mm -hmm. I needed to sort of find those ripples and then follow those ripples. Uh, and that's what this book has done. Hmm. And before we kind of come back to Dead House Gates, um, I just want to, we didn't talk about it the first time we chatted. Um, do you, anything to say on, on Walk and Shadow, Walk and Shadow, Carcanus? Do you, do you anything to touch in on? Any Anything to throw out there? Or, or still on the back burner, so to speak? It's on the back burner, but a part of me, once I'm finished this one, um, The God is Not Willing, I feel a, a, an itch to get back to uh, Walk and Shadow um, and to go back into that writing style, which... Um, was a highly addictive writing style, even though it wasn't particularly popular amongst the readers. It was yeah. very addictive to write. And I do really want to um, deliver um, that third book because it will sort of explain a lot of things that are the questions a lot of fans um, use about it, you know, yeah. all the time. Yeah. And it'll also confuse a lot of them even more. So that's okay. <laughs> a healthy mixture. Yes. Absolutely. Hello everyone, producer AJ here. Still amazed that we got Steven Erickson to come on the show a second time. A huge, huge thanks to Steve for wanting to come chat again. We really appreciate it. And also, thank you so much to you, the listener. Uh, without your support and your engagement on Twitter and in our emails and everywhere else, there would be no show. So seriously, thank you so, so much for listening to this show. Uh, as always, thank you very much to Dan Gesrick for making our spectacular logo. You can follow him on Twitter at Dan Gesrick for the hottest Jeff Wilpin takes. And of course, the wonderful music in today's episode is by the one and only Amaranthin from their album The New Romantic, which you can find along with their other music on bandcamp.com. Links to their pages will be in the show notes, and 10 Very Big Books will be back next week on February 21st with the first episode of Memories of Ice. We'll be doing the prologue, chapters 1, 2, and 3. So we hope to see you then. Let's get back to the interview. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Um, I think I think now is a very appropriate time for us to take a quick detour to our favorite locale, Pronunciation Nation. Oh, um, nice. AJ, that's, that sounds yeah. relaxed. That's, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, we... Uh, first off, I didn't write this list, and looking at them, I'm a little scared to even try to pronounce some of them. Yeah, so I, I refuse. I will well, not. Well, a lot of them are memories of Ice Name. I was trying to set us up going into, you know, oh, the new book. okay. Who wrote the list? Uh, I think Peter. So, Peter, go for it. All right. I'm going with uh, M Mib Mibby. Mibe. Mibe. All right. I, I'll type Peter. You, you, I got it. Humbral Tower. Humbral Tower. Yeah. All right. P 
Paninian Domain. Panin Domain. Panin Domain. Yes. Teniscauri. Teniscauri. All All right, right, nailed it. it. Uh, The Prince of Kepistan is Jalarkan. Jalarkan, yeah. Jalarkan. Brokillian. And Kepistan. Kepistan. Uh, Brokillian. Brokillian. All right. It's a brew. Uh, Finier, we're good on. The, you know, Tenorock? Tenorock? Tenorock, yeah. Mm. Uh, Treach? Treach? Yep. Mm. Uh, Kachain oh, Chim- Kachain Chamal, that good? Yep. Uh, okay, let me take this one because Peter said that it that th- this isn't even a question. But I was reading about it, and somebody said Beneath was beneath, and I just want to confirm that it's Beneath and not beneath. Yeah, it's Beneath. Oh, fine. Um, Bowden, Bowden, Bowden. Okay, yeah. panic. Yep. Oh, fine. it is a it's a full panic. Yeah. Nice. Um, All right. Yeah. There was All right, somebody... I'm, I'm feeling good on the pronunciation. I mean, listen, we're going to botch it for sure. Oh, you yeah, know, I but... know. This, honestly, I know. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw... I got one final question. Uh, I, I, I've really been itching. Um, so, uh, how dare you <laughs> tell me to begin this question? I always um, dare. Yes, you, you clearly <laughs> always dare. So there is a moment in the story when the chain of dogs is its at the final link. Uh, they're out of water. They have no supplies. They're clearly going to die. And Steven Erickson goes, no, it's fine. There's these intradimensional giant carriages. And they're yeah. very fun. And, and how and why? And then in like two paragraphs, you're like, I'm, I, two paragraphs, I was like, yep, totally. Got it. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah, the um, Tregal Trade Guild was an invention in, set in Darujistan initially. And um, it seemed obvious that, you know, in, in retrospect, that yes, you would have a delivery system. You'd have a FedEx through the Warrens. Um, <laughs> because why wouldn't you, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess, but like. Why wouldn't you? The, the yeah. Empire treats the Warren travel as so dangerous, and you're like, nah, we're good. Well, of course it is. <laughs> Of course it is and that's why i mean you're going to see more of them and they're a lot of fun yeah. to write because that's um, why they have a lot of money they just come barreling in literally out of nowhere um mm. and usually pieces of corpse falling off the, the, the <laughs> carriages and um smoke uh-huh. pouring off of it and, and you know the horses are just terrified and because they just travel through places that nobody should travel through mm. and um and yeah they're a lot of fun <laughs> they're a lot of fun I again that was that was my throw the book across the room moment. I was like, I'm gonna come back to this. I'm sure he'll convince me it's good, but I did just read Giant Carriage Horse Planes and I just gone. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um and it is one of the risks that I take because because we game this world, I mean the Tregal Trade Guild is, is old news to me, just like the Azap houses were in you know, and then they show up out of the blue in Gardens of the Moon. Yeah. Um but they for us you know, Cam and I, they were old news. We gained through all this stuff. So mm. um, it only became an issue of, okay, when do I introduce them? And at what point do I introduce them? And because I needed something to, to be delivered to Coltane, which you would then give to Duiker, even though it was meant for Coltane. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So that had to be delivered. And then there was a secondary delivery um, on the path of hands. But um, So yeah, uh, I gather India, you really did not like Iskarol Pust. Yeah, yeah, okay, fair. I just didn't understand the the role because the per- he just seems like a crazy person who said things that were like kind of funny but also mildly like disturbing all the oh, time. Yeah. Oh yeah, highly disturbing. And I, just, mm-hmm. and I didn't under and it's like is he smart or is he is he just an idiot who just babbles things? But sometimes they're ac- accurate. Like is he a liar? Is he, I just don't I don't get it. <laughs> good, good. Good. Yeah. And I, he, he, he's supposed to keep you guessing. That's the whole point of Iskaro Pust. Because he is he is our stand in for what Shadow Throne is up to. Yeah. And so throughout the entire series, you're kept guessing as to what Shadow Throne is up to. Oh, and please don't. Iskaro is, Pust is, is, he is the spokesperson for Shadow Throne. <laughs> he's going to return like, if that's he's what gonna you're going to return. Oh, yeah. He's so awful. He's Puster. so awful. All right. I'm, I'm calling it. This is our first merch. I'm, we're going to make Pust or Bust shirts. Pust that's our first bust. one. Oh, my goodness. I, I will also tell you that there is an uh, impending clash much later in the series uh, yeah. where Iskaro Pust is facing off with Krupp. No. It, it's a meeting with of the who? minds. 
crop. It's a meeting of the no. <laughs> that sounds like the most disturbing. <laughs> I could buy that book and read that section in Spanish and would get just as much out of it as if I, I read I it in English. I was just going to say oh, yeah. that. It's a I highly was just going to say that. And I'm sure in, at, by the end we're going to be like, oh... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Six books Pe later. That makes yeah. sense. The, the, the Reddit's going to be like, well, if you read only the every third word of every fourth line, it spills the plot. Like, Literally. And that's well, my thing, got a, too. Well, a long ways to go before that meeting. So mm -hmm. Yeah, we got some time. Uh, we're... Several thousand pages. Awesome. Easily. Yeah. <laughs> Although I feel like right. half of the Skarl Pust fun is uh, Mogara. I don't know how to say her name. Um, Mogara. Yeah. And, we, and we meet at the very end, yes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. She is a hoot as well, so. Yes, uh, they, they are a uh, husband-wife team. That they're a package deal. They really oh, wow. A power couple, if you will. They're, yeah, they're one of the world's power couples. <laughs> um, it's funny, though, because reading it, like, something like Iskarl Pust, um, like, when he speaks, I'm like, okay, like, I know, I think that this is supposed to confuse me. But when I'm reading other just average pages in the book that are just, you know, day-to-day -day activities with like Diker, whatever, I'm still like, what am I reading? That was that was truly the toughest part for me was um the chain of dogs. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I could I That's I you're not inclined to military stories as well. To, to exactly soldiers. Yeah. It is a chain so, there are a lot of characters to keep track of in the Chain of Dogs as well, um, which does not help at all. Oh, uh, no. Wait till you get to Memories of Ice. Yeah, right? That was my thought. <laughs> Great. Currently reading. Oh, yeah? You're starting? Yeah. You starting? Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Yes. I missed Ganabacus. Good. It's nice to be Ganabac there. That's nice. a sec. You, you reused the joke, Josh. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> you doubled it. Darn it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I wanted to ask a fun dog question, but maybe before I'll ask a, a less fun question. Um, the the book evokes biblical imagery in my mm -hmm. eye, uh, mm -hmm. and esp especially Christ figures. Yeah. And um, like Coltane saves the meek, they walk across water, and in the end, he is crucified. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll leave it a little open and ask like how you conceive of Christ figures in fiction and or in fantasy, and maybe why you chose to evoke that specifically in this story. This is going to sound insane, but um, I actually wanted to explore the birth of a religion, mm. but I wanted to wait until the 10 books were done. And so quite ironically, the book I'm writing right now is exploring the birth of religions. And one of those religions is the um, the feather or the black feather, the crow. Uh, it's all occulting. Yeah. And so it's taken a long time, but I wanted, to, you know, quite often, um, well, basically, when we look through uh, the history of religion, um, all the main players are from 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, you know, uh, Buddha, Jesus, um, Confucius, they're all back then. But imagine you as the reader getting to see where it all begins. Yeah. You just told me that you wrote a whole series and a book within that series so that you could write a second series 3,000 years later. Is that what I'm getting? Well, it's not 3,000 years later. No, it's it, in this okay. case, it's, um, I mean, Christianity sort of took about 30 years uh, following um, crucifixion of Christ to really gain some, some traction. Mm. And so... This, uh, the God is not willing, is kind of, you know, 15 years after. Oh. 16, 17 years after the fall of Cotain. So uh, it's in that period oh. of, of that traction being gained. Okay, now that, now you've got my attention. You've got cults, you've got Gnostic cults, especially related to it. Um, and most of that religion is actually born in the Seven Cities, ironically. Mm. Um, and so it's kind of a backstory to what I'm writing in, the, in these novels, but it's there. Hmm. Um, and I did want to explore that because, I mean, I started as an anthropologist, so this stuff interests me. So when really you're writing Dead House Gates, this this was on your mind that yeah. you, he would kind of serve as a almost future historical figure. Yeah, and mm. that's why I mean that's why Duker is there, and you know, and that's why he's the witness. Um, yeah. We have various witnesses. Um, people all stood on the wall. Probably know there's twelve of them. You know, it, it's it's that kind of subtextual stuff going on, and each will have their tale to tell about what they saw and, and experienced there. Yeah, mm. I was just going to ask if you have a dog nowadays. You know, you mentioned you had one earlier. No, I travel too much. It just wouldn't work. Mm. Mm. No. 
Oh, I do have a quick, very unrelated question to something you said earlier. Uh, well, you've mentioned before that the, the Malazan started as a tabletop game. Do we meet or hear about your character, or were you the GM? Uh, Cam and I alternated. Um, so he carried some storylines, I carried some other ones. So are any of your characters players or, or names we hear from the histories? Um, God, yeah. I mean, tons of them. Ah, that's fun. Go back to Gardens of the Moon. Uh, I played... Cam ran the game. He created the city of Darujistan. I played four characters. I played Krupp, Ralik Nam. Ooh. Um, no, maybe just those two, now that I think about it. Crocus was not a played character. He was a fictional creation. Um, mm. Certainly yeah. Krupp and Ralik Nam were, were two of the main ones. And the NPCs were Cole and Marilio and Baruch. Um, my first character ever was Anamanda Rake. Mm. Oh, that's, I mean, that's... That's a good fact. That's a good yeah. first character. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> he stayed with us for a long time. He, he mm -hmm. migrated from AD&D straight into GURPS. And uh, that was fine, because we ended up at GURPS. Mm. Um, I played Fiddler, uh, Kalam, Quick mm. Ben, um, and Whiskey Jack, and uh, Kaladin Brood as well. Um, mm. Cam ran some great games, great campaigns. Did you game on Lether as well? No. Uh, oh, I did, but many years later, after um, Cam was living in, I don't know where he was. He might have been in Japan, actually, by that time. Um, yeah. So I had I had five friends with whom, for whom I, I, I ran that, that campaign. When when you guys say campaign, and, and what is what is the meaning of that? It's basically a, a narrated novel, um, although it can be a short story or a chapter in a novel. But uh, generally, a campaign is... is where you're taking the same characters through um, an extended period of, of uh, history in that world that you created. Yeah. So you stay how with do you, them. How do you know when it's over? Um, it's, Sorry. No, no. <laughs> I, I guess you just know. Um, yeah. Because I've never, I don't even, I've never even, I, this is like the first time hearing of this, like Peter is so. Right, right. Well, you have to, you have to try, try to play a game. I, yeah, I know. I told you last time I wasn't included in the gameplay. Yeah. She felt like I didn't invite her. I wasn't invited to the gameplay, so. <laughs> um, uh, it feels like we're wrapping up. We're wrapping up, it feels. Um, but may maybe. I don't know. I don't know. No, anyway. just you said the same sentence twice. I don't know. I, I Here's a question. Huh. <laughs> uh, we talked about it a bit earlier. Uh, Felicin, uh in the book faces a loss of innocence amongst uh, other characters who are learning truths about the cruelty uh, uh, that people are capable of and mm -hmm. facing brutal failures. Um, the ideas and the plot are pretty woven together. And uh, I, I'd almost ask, and we talked about it earlier when you're talking about kind of progressing linearly through the story, uh, whether either of those came first or whether the same kind of themes of everyone's journeys kind of were known from the start if that makes any sense um well it came first in the sense of uh hmm i knew i was going to have to send to listen to the otatero minds and so it was a question then of getting her there um and i knew i wanted to sort of deliver that uh, sense of betrayal um, related to the three siblings of perrin uh tavor and Felicin. um but Scene by scene, I probably invented on the fly. Mm. I probably uh, created a lot of it as as I went. I I remember that when I first wrote the prologue, um, I didn't even know that Bowden was going to be a major character uh, in the story. He just was kind of there to punctuate uh, the brutality of, of uh, the march out of uh, the city of Unta. But then it, it suddenly struck me that... Uh, that's an interesting threesome, um, if you mm -hmm. excuse the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. term. Um, Heboric, uh, Bowden, and uh, Felicin. Um, yeah, I, I sensed uh, an interesting synergy uh, by using all three of them. And so I just mm -hmm. went with it. And then Bowden became far more complicated as a character because he's an inarticulate character. Um, and they are really fun to write because you don't give anything away with them. And so they, bec they they remain mysterious. Are you guys watching um, Sex Education? Yes, I binged the whole season last. Uh, Did you? It's like uh, soap good. Yeah. 
So you know the uh, the the uh, headmaster's son. Yes, he's an inarticulate character. Oh, he's it's so good. He's done. like yeah, he's so good. He is so good. Yeah, because you just don't know what's going on in that guy's head mm -hmm. at all, right? Yeah, that kind of thing. I like that stuff. Mm. I'm so well, glad to know Steve Erickson watched the Steve ed Sex Education. This is an incredible revelation. Yeah, oh, no, I that feel like one, I should watch it. Scream Queens. Oh, yeah. Oh. oh. <laughs> Oh, I uh, Scream Queens. Did you, I know Picard just started? Did you watch that? Don't get me started on that one. <laughs> Are you? We, we can you can offer some hot Star Trek takes if you want. You know. Well, all I can say is, who knew that you know the spitting blood of Romulans could make androids explode? Mm. I have no idea what that means, but it, yeah. the vitriol in that Watch sentence. Picard, you'll know it. Yeah. Interesting. Utterly ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll watch the second episode and see how it goes. I I haven't written a review on it yet, but um, I'm, mm. I'm I'm not I'm not encouraged. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I I think that there's a a leeriness in returning. I think. Yeah. Well, it doesn't help that you know, somebody else pointed out to me. Um, the storyline seems to be lifted from Babylon 5's um, uh, short-lived, well, pilot episode that wasn't followed called The Legend of the Rangers. Which then morphed into a fan-based Star Trek a series called Star Trek Renegades, and it seems as if a lot of the characters that Picard's going to be interacting with are just pulled straight from there. So, mm. you know, the lack of originality just continues to plague uh, this writing group. Oh my god! <laughs> I I wish I had more Star Trek knowledge to bring to the table. You know? Oh my gosh! I can't wait to watch it now. Just dunk on this episode and make everyone that I watch it with make it. I just want to seem so smart. Oh, that's good. Exactly <laughs> pair of what it is. Yes. And then you'll be like, yes, man, yes. Josh knows a lot. <laughs> India, do you have any final questions? Really? Way to put me on the spot there after that <laughs> star, star trek. Gone. Um, let me think. I mean, honestly. You can put Josh on the spot if you want. I didn't yeah, have one. Because... Well, well, India, I mean, let me ask you. Uh, was oh, it really an ordeal to read? Dead Hell's Gates. Okay, that seems. This is. This is a. Ugh, okay, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It just takes a while for me to understand what's going on. Like it takes like a, a long while, and a lot of the people that listen to the podcast like recognize that it takes like super long for me to like figure out what's going on. So once I, I think like I always get really excited about it toward the end because like You're now it's like no <laughs> <laughs> no because like at that point the story's happened and i already now it's like okay what's now what's really like what did all this lead up to so i get really excited for like i want to say like the like the last eight chapters i think is like where the most fun happens mm -hmm. Agreed. um actually in this case it was kind of sad though yeah, that's kind of the whole idea is is if you're going to invest the amount of reading and time to go through a 1,200-page book, the last two 300 pages had better be a good payoff. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's yeah. my, my view on each novel. Um, so I work, uh, I work as hard as I can to deliver that payoff because I know the reader has invested a lot of time and they don't want to be left sort of thinking, oh, well, what was the point of that? Yeah. Uh, what was the point mm -hmm. of, of me spending all that time reading this thing? Um but at the same time, I realized with Dead House Gates that I was not really writing fantasies with tragic endings, but tragedies with fantastic elements. Oh, so everything shifted. Everything shifted. And then I was thinking in terms of catharsis and, and then gestures of humanity and compassion. And that's what really sort of, for me, um, invigorated uh, the writing of this stuff. So you'll get the same, in a sense, uh, with Memories of Ice. Mm -hmm. I'd probably up the ante even more with that one. Oh, goodness. You know, for like, I, I wish that I had a better understanding going into the um into these these novels like of fantasy and, and tropes and um just because for me now, I, I wish that I could have like the the conversations that Josh and Peter can have rather than just kind of like being on the outside listening in and like chiming in when I can. Um, But I think I, I'm getting better and better as I as I. Like, I'm definitely stronger than I was the first time that I, when I read the first book. Now, I'm only hoping that I can, like, realize more of what you're doing. Um, well, well, yeah, I mean, it's been a crash course for you. Um, one of the things where I'm 
undermining fantasy tropes, um, you need to know the tropes <laughs> in order to exactly. recognize them. And the fact that you know you'd read Hunger Games, I think, was it. Oh, so um, no familiarity with the tropes. In which case, a lot of this stuff just zings on past you, and you, you didn't catch it. Yeah. And so, I have great sympathy. Yeah, great sympathy for you. But it's not. It's not. In a, it's not like to say it that I don't enjoy it. It's just like, it's like, like when there's somebody tells a joke and you miss the whole joke and now everybody's like laughing and you just are like, okay. Exactly. Yeah. It's interesting. You say that about kind of driving towards that, um, conversion near the end of the books, which is a hundred percent the case. Right. But I also think, uh, something unique throughout the books is lots of them kind of do have, um, they kind of play with pacing, with very climactic sequences, not necessarily at the end of the book. You know, definitely Memories of Ice has um, different different, uh, different points, different peaks throughout it. And Absolutely. so does something like book six. And then, um, yeah, so I think, um, how do you, how did you go about measuring where to put those different peaks, if that makes any sense? Well, the two you mentioned, uh, you're thinking um, Bone Hunters? Yeah. Uh, Bone Hunter is basically two novels, and yeah. I just have to jam them together. Um, I guess maybe Memories of Ice uh, could have been that. I think you're you must you're probably referring to the Siege of, of Capistan. Yeah, which um, again is about about the what three quarter point or something, and it seems like it it should be the climax. And then, I guess in a sense, once I wrote those things those scenes out, then the challenge was well, how can I up this? Yeah. So I, I, I upped it by uh, inverting um, a lot of it so that it became more about the people involved as opposed to, you know, a city being overrun or um, a major battle or anything along those lines. It's actually about the people involved. So, yeah. So it's like, yeah, there's, there's two climatic sequences, but they should have two very different flavors to them. Hmm. And, yeah. and speaking Josh. of flavors... My final oh, question for the night. <laughs> you keep setting me up. I'm going to keep taking them. All right. We are currently at the tail end of January. We are in the thick of winter. My question is, Steve, on a cold winter's morn, what is the what is your hot beverage of choice that you reach for? Um, on a morning? Any time of day, honestly. <laughs> like when you're cold and you're like, I'm trying to read and here's a blanket. Let me get some hot something. What's that hot All something? Right. I see. Um, these days, it's oh, I hate to do this because I was just trashing Picard. It's um, <laughs> it's Earl Grey, but it's decaf, which he actually uh, orders in it's Picard so episode, which mm. makes me kind of groan inside. But um, <laughs> yeah, I have to avoid avoid caffeine these days. So mm. um, that probably would be it. Now, are you a milk and sugar honey with your tea, or you just drink it straight? Uh. These days, I'm also lactose intolerant, so it's lactose-free milk mm. and a little bit of white sugar. Um, All right. You can't use cane sugar for tea. It's just, oh, no. It doesn't dissolve well. No. I'm glad you squeezed in another food question, Josh. I will end every one of these with a food question if I can. Well, maybe I'll ask to, to maybe go out on... If you were to write Dead House Gates again today, do you think you would do anything differently? Well, I mean, if, if certainly if I dropped some, you know horrendous inconsistencies in there that that came back and bit me later um i would fix those <laughs> um Is that but no i think not uh, i think that one really felt very very tight in terms of the writing process gardens on the moon yeah i may well have changed certain things on that one but um no no i don't think so I feel pretty good about um dead house gates well, yeah, i think you should have it's a pretty book, good book yeah. eh? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, thank you Favorite one I've read so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we're heading in the right direction. Though. We are. It's just going to get better and better. I can feel it. <laughs> um. Well, uh, I'm I'm glad you you came back on the show. It was it was a pleasure chatting with you. Well, I'll see you guys after uh, Memories of Ice then. Woo! Yeah, we look forward Such to it. Such a treat. Oh, cool. That's what keeps me coming back. <laughs> All righty. Well, I guess we'll talk then. Yeah. Already have fun with the third book. Oh yeah, I oh. we I already read the first three. I'm pretty I'm pretty excited. Yeah, we're, I didn't we're, know I, I didn't know I liked the Talani Mass until like 
the beginning of this one, and now I'm very invested in learning all about them. What? The beginning? It starts with them, like, start chasing murdering. a giant. What, what are you talking about, Josh? Oh, a, a oh, I didn't say it. Children. Okay, okay I'm backing it up. I didn't say I, like, <laughs> empathize. I'm curious. All right. Uh, all right. We'll, we'll save it. We'll save it for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, you did, you missed, uh, Steve, you, you may have missed it. I got a lot of Twitter backlash. I did make a statement that I thought Coltane should cut and run from the refugees, which I apologized for on the final episode <laughs> of the book. But there was a lot of Twitter anger about that statement. Really? The whole so, point <laughs> is that he didn't kill the refugees, Josh. That's quite amazing. Yeah. Um, I think was it, was in the, it was in one of the chapters when the nobles are the worst. And I was like, I'm done with them. Yeah. Oh, the nobles! I can't believe we didn't talk about them. Th- that one getting his oh, getting his throat caved in was just so satisfying, which is almost <laughs> disturbing. Just how satisfying it was. You know, it's <laughs> funny. In many respects, when I look back on Dead House Gates, the the scene that has the most emotion for me is when Duker has delivered the last of the refugees, and he's on his horse, and he wheels the oh. horse, and he looks back to the north, and in a sense, I kind of wanted that pause so he could run through the memories of, of everything that led up to him getting there. Mm-hmm. And it, to me, it, it, it's the most cinematic, I think, of, um, although the fall itself is very cinematic. But um, oh. that, was, that was, for me, the emotional um, peak of yeah. that novel. Mm. And you guys didn't even mention it. I can't believe it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um well uh we we got a little off but that uh, th- th- thank you again for coming on the show and we look forward to talking to you soon absolutely yeah. mm-hmm. all right take care bye, bye. 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 three two one there you go that wasn't in sync <laughs> <laughs> no, it, AJ's got it in post. <laughs>